Reality Unlimited by Robert Silverberg It was to be the last word in theater fun. You experienced the action as if you were there. The trouble was, the fun could become too real. Reality Unlimited by Robert Silverberg It was going to be the show of the century, absolutely the tops. There was a line eight blocks long outside the theater, the theater that had been specifically built to contain Ultarama. Paul Hendricks had been in line since early the morning before, and so he was only a block or so from the still unopened ticket booth. His wife had come by from time to time, bringing sandwiches and coffee. Hendricks was determined to get a pair of tickets. He turned to the man next to him. Got the time? Five to nine. That's what I thought. That means the ticket office opens in five minutes. Hendricks rose on tippy toes and squinted ahead. There must be five hundred people ahead of us. They say the theater holds five thousand. I know, and that you get the same effect no matter where you sit. But still, I'd like to be right down there in the front. The other man nodded. That goes for all of us. Hendricks grinned. You know, this is the first time I ever heard of an opening performance being managed right. I mean, throw open to public sale instead of being reserved for bigwigs. Damn public-spirited, the other agreed. Suddenly the line began to edge forward. They're selling tickets. The booth is open. About an hour later, Hendricks plunked down his twenty dollars before the efficient-looking girl in the ticket cage and was handed a bulky envelope. These are my tickets? That's right, sir. A little puzzled but happy, he turned away and dug in the envelope. He pulled out not the familiar pasteboards, but two costly-looking, scrumptiously engraved invitations on thick, stiff paper. They said, You are invited to the first showing anywhere in the world of Ultarama, the sensational new film process, realer than life. Wednesday, April 25th, 1973, at 8 p.m. Clutching the invitations as if they were his lease on life, Hendricks stepped into the quick trans, and moments later, stepped out again, just outside the door. His wife was waiting for him, with an expectant look on her face. Did you get them? I sure did. Two engraved invitations at ten bucks a throw. They better be worth it, she said anxiously. Didn't you see that line when you brought me breakfast? Eight blocks. Hundreds and hundreds of people, all trying to get to see the first performance. That doesn't mean a thing, she said. After all, no one has ever seen the complete movie. It's not a movie, he corrected. All right, the complete whatchamacallit. No one's ever seen the complete thing, not even the people who made it. So how do you know it's good? Believe me, honey, this is going to be the greatest ever. On Wednesday, April 25th, 1973, at 7.30 in the evening, the Hendricks stood in the midst of a vast crowd that thronged the open plaza before the Ultarama Theater. The theater itself was a towering edifice that had been built just for this production. It was one of the world's most impressive buildings. All right, all right, a policeman shouted. Ticket holders come this way. The rest of you stay back. They cleared a channel through the mob, and the Hendricks, along with several hundred other early arrivees, followed along to the door of the vast theater. "'What are all these people doing here?' Mrs. Hendricks asked. Her husband shrugged. "'Maybe they plan on crashing the gate. Or possibly they think there may be some extra tickets left. I tell you, we're awfully lucky to be where we are right now.' He extended the invitations to a tall, haughty-looking doorman in a resplendent uniform. The doorman merely nodded and gestured them inside. Don't they tear up the tickets? Not on opening night, Hendricks said. 
They're letting us keep them as souvenirs. They stepped inside and found themselves in a vast, almost boundless vestibule, carpeted in a deep-piled synthofoam of a lush purple color. Vaulting arches of gleaming metal swept upward to a barely visible ceiling. If this is just the foyer, Paul Hendricks said, imagine what it must be inside. His wife nudged him. Look, isn't that shocking? A girl of about seventeen was coming toward them, smiling cheerfully. Hendricks blinked. She wore only two nearly transparent strips of shimmering cloth, one over her breast and the other wrapped around her hips. Good evening, she said. I'm your usher. May I show you to your seats? They really put on a show here, Hendricks muttered. The girl glanced at the invitations he was clutching and beckoned them to follow her. She led the way, twitching her hips invitingly. A bright, aluminoid door loomed before them. The girl touched a switch, and the door slid back, revealing the actual interior of the theater. Hendricks gasped. It was nearly the size of a football stadium. Where the playing field should be were seats. Elaborate, plush, pneumatic affairs. And ringing the seats was the screen. The screen covered the entire walls, floor, ceiling. It hemmed the audience in completely. As Hendricks took his seat, he felt totally surrounded by it. They waited impatiently for a half hour to pass. The theater filled up rapidly, the first-nighters in all their finery. I'm glad we wore our formal clothes, dear. Yes, said Hendricks, looking at the others. This is quite an event. Quite an event. The theater was totally filled by 8 p.m. sharp. The corps of near-nude usherettes performed their job swiftly and efficiently. And suddenly a voice said, Welcome to Ultrama. It was a cultured, soft, female voice, and it came so close to him that he glanced in surprise at his wife. But she was looking at him. She had heard the voice, too. It continued, You are about to witness the most spectacular form of entertainment ever conceived by the mind of man. Twelve years of concentrated work went into producing what you were about to see, and no one but you will experience it. Each of you will take part. Each of you will, as the series of scenes we have assembled unfolds, be caught up in the reality of Ultrama, the realer-than-reality, ultra-reality of Ultrama. Shall we begin? The lights in the theater dimmed, and the vast screen came to life. It was incredible. They were in Africa. The huge plains of South Africa opened out before them. Hendricks turned his head, looking around in astonishment. The audience seemed to have disappeared. He was alone, alone in a world of yellowing grass and strange thick trees, a flat world where death could strike at any moment. In the distance he saw four grotesque shapes, giraffes, moving along in their ungainly but yet tremendously rapid way, their long necks projecting stiffly from their bodies. He repressed a chuckle. And then a low growl made him jump. He backed against the rough bark tree and felt sweat cascade down his body as a tawny shape sprang from behind a twisted shrub, pounced on one of the giraffes, smashing the fragile neck with a fierce swipe of its paw. The lioness. Sudden death springing from nowhere, a bright streak that brought violence. Hendricks looked around uneasily. The giraffes had fled. The lioness was dragging her kill into the underbrush. The warm smell of death was in the air, that and the buzzing of green-eyed flies an inch long. Perched on a scrawny, almost leafless tree were hooded, ugly shapes. Vultures. Are they waiting for me? 
It was too real. This was unbearably real. A herd of gazelles came bounding out of the background, relieving some of the tension. The lovely creatures seemed to float along, touching the ground only at occasional intervals. Behind them marched the dull gray bulks of a herd of elephants, shambling with a ponderous gait. This was Africa. This was the real thing, Henderson told himself. It wasn't a show. Through some magic, the Ultarama people had actually sent him here. He moved away, investigating. A sluggish black stream wound through the jungle. Curious, Hendricks walked toward it. Dark logs lay strewn, almost at random, in the shallow muddy water at the sides of the stream. But as he watched, one of those logs yawned, showing a double row of deadly teeth, and slid sleepily off into the deeper waters. Crocodiles. Death threatened everywhere in the jungle. Monkeys chittered overhead. Bright-plumaged birds flapped from tree to tree. Hendricks felt the heat. His nostrils drew in the smell. This was real. He wondered if it would ever end, if he would ever return to his neat little city apartment, and to his wife and children. He glanced away from the stream, looking up at the sun blazing in the bright blue sky. And abruptly, Black Death came roaring at him from a tree. Hendricks had just a moment to recognize it. A leopard, black, sleek, moving with an easy grace of a machine designed for killing. He toppled backward under the impetus of the beast's furious attack, smelled the soft, musky smell of the killer. Then Claws reached for his throat. Hot barbs of red pain shot through him. He screamed out fought, tried to hold the snapping jaws away. No, no, it's not real. Get away from me. And in that instant, Africa vanished. The second illusion, that soft voice next to his ear said. He was again alone, in an unfamiliar room. A lady's boudoir, he saw. A satin-covered spread lay over the wide, inviting bed. Dressing tables were laden with perfumes and cosmetics. Behind him, the door opened. A woman entered. He had never seen her before. She was tall, dressed only in a filmy negligee that barely concealed her long, sleek legs, her firm breasts. She was all that he had ever wanted in a woman. She awakened desires that had been dead in him for twenty years. Hello, she said. Her voice was throbbingly throaty. I've waited a long time for you, Paul Hendricks. How did she know my name? How? Then he stopped asking questions. She had glided close to him, stood there, bosom gently rising and falling, looking into his eyes. She was nearly as tall as he. He smelled her enticing perfume. Come, she said, taking his hand. She led him toward a chaise lounge. He frowned. But my wife, he muttered, feeling like seventeen different kinds of idiot, as he said the words. Your wife is happy where she is. Come to me, Paul. She drew him down beside her. What seemed like hours went by. Suddenly he felt a rough hand grab him, awakening him. A stranger stood there, fully dressed, menacing glint in his eye. "'Who is this man, Louise?' he demanded. A wide-eyed shock was evident on the woman's face. "'But I didn't expect you until—' "'Of course not.' Hendricks watched in horror as the newcomer drew a gun from his pocket. He lifted it. The barrel seemed pointed directly at Hendricks' eyes. The finger began to tighten on the trigger. The third illusion, said the soft voice. And he was holding a billowing net and a strange three-prong weapon. The sound of a roaring multitude reached his ears. He blinked, orienting himself to the new illusion, and saw that he was in an immense stadium. 
curiously garbed people were staring down at him. My God, he thought, the Colosseum! And even as the thought of recognition burst from him, he saw his opponent advancing over the bloody sand. It was a swarthy, broad-shouldered man in a leather tunic, wielding a thick, short sword. Swordsman against netmen. It was deadly, deadly. Hendricks knew enough history to be aware of what was expected of him. He had to ensnare the swordsman in the net and kill him with the trident before that fierce sword could pierce his heart. It was anything but an equal contest, but with proper agility. The sword flashed on high. Desperately, Hendricks parried it with the hilt of his trident and whirled the net through the air. The swordsman laughed and leapt back. Hendricks advanced looking for an opening. The roars of the crowd were deafening. He swung the net tentatively, readied himself for the cast. Tired muscles throbbed in his arms and thighs. The swordsman retreated deftly, smiling. He looked confident. Hendricks began the cast. Suddenly the sword flashed again. It was a lightning-fast attack. Hendricks managed to get the trident up to protect himself. The impact sent pain coursing up his arm, and numbed, he dropped the three-pronged weapon. Laughing jovially, his opponent kicked the trident far across the stadium and advanced with the sword. Hendricks knew what he had to do. He dropped to his knees before the advancing swordsman and gestured toward the audience. The swordsman nodded. He lifted the sword, held it over Hendricks' head, and looked up at the grand dais. Hendricks looked up as well. The thumbs went down, emphatically so. The sword began to descend. The fourth illusion, said the voice. He was racing madly down the Indianapolis Speedway, bobbing along at nearly a hundred and fifty miles an hour in a flimsy-looking little racing auto. Blurs whizzed by on all sides. Ahead of him he saw a car suddenly swerve into the embankment and burst into a mass of flames. With desperate urgency he yanked on the wheel, tried to avoid the pile-up, and failed. He felt his car going end over end into the air and shut his eyes, waiting for the explosion that would follow. The fifth illusion, the voice said. He was in a prehistoric jungle. Strange, stumpy trees were all around, lush vegetation. A slow-moving beast of immense size was thundering away from him, its tiny head close to the ground, snapping up vegetation without cease. Overhead, a leathery winged flying reptile moved through the air in jerky swoops. There was sudden thunder behind him. He turned. Through a haze of giant mosquitoes, he saw a mountain of a beast advancing toward him, tiny foreclaws clutching the air, vast head opening to reveal foot-long teeth. He started to run, but even as he did so he knew it was fruitless. In the steamy jungle sweat poured down him like summer rain. The hot breath of the Tyrannosaurus was only feet behind him. Hendricks turned, looked up. The mighty jaws were opening the knife-like teeth beckoning. No! he screamed. No! Suddenly all went blank. He sat in numb silence for an instant, realizing he was back in the theater. A voice in his ear said, There will be a brief intermission before proceeding to the remaining half of the program. Please remain in your seats to avoid confusion. Thank you. Hendricks shook his head wearily. He was dizzy, utterly exhausted. His stiff white shirt had lost all its starch. He was bathed in sweat. His hands shook. His fingernails, he noticed, had been chewed to the quick. He felt as if he had been to hell and back. He finally mustered enough strength to look over at his wife. She was sitting back in her plush chair, utterly beaten. He glanced around the theater. The other first-nighters were sitting in attitudes ranging from glassy-eyed exhaustion 
to complete nervous breakdown. The second part of the program will begin in three minutes, the pleasant voice said. Oh, no, it won't, Hendricks muttered out loud. His voice sounded like a harsh croak in his ears. He seized his wife by the hand. She felt cold, clammy. Let's go, Dot. Let's get out of here. She came to life and nodded in silent agreement. Past the pretty near-nude usherettes, through the huge vestibule, out into the coolness of the night air and the relative peace of the city. There were still some people gathered outside. How is it? Real nice? Is it over? Hey, you're leaving so soon! Hendricks ignored them. He hailed a jet cab, helped his wife in, staggered in himself. He gave the driver his address. You coming from the Ultrama show? the driver asked. Hendricks nodded. Swell thing, ain't it? It's supposed to be real, and I mean real. It sure is, Hendricks agreed. He leaned back and tried to relax. His nerves were still quivering like overtaught harp strings. It's quite a thing, he said, but not for me. I'm going home. I'm going to take a nice calming shower, a sedative, and get in bed. Then I'm going to read a nice quiet book. How about you, Dot? She nodded. That's real enough for me, she said. The end of Reality Unlimited by Robert Silverberg